Good evening and welcome to another study in the book of Acts. This evening we're going to finish up Acts chapter 18. And, but before we begin, will you bow your head with me and I will lead us in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we're thankful for this day that you have given us and we're thankful for the blessings of this life. We're thankful for Jesus who died for our sins. Be with us now as we look into your word and help us to understand it and obey it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, so last time we talked about the uh, Sosthenes being uh, beat publicly. Galileo or Galileo was uh, the, the, the one who, who dismissed all the charges for Paul, didn't even allow the charges to be heard. And then, in, as we're in Corinth, here, after he had left the judgment area there, as we talked about um, last time, we are left in verse 18 um, where we left off. So, uh, before we go into the questions, let's read a little bit. Starting in Acts chapter 18, in verse 18. So Paul remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went all over all the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Okay. So, getting right into it, in verse 18, as we are in Corinth right now, um, it says that Paul remained a good while. We don't know if this uh, good while means that it's longer than the year and six months that the scriptures had already told us he had stayed. Um, it seems to indicate that it was uh, in addition to the time that it mentioned in in verse 11 of chapter 18. He continued there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. But we don't know 100% uh, whether that's the case or not. Either way, um, Paul was, uh, was released and um, there was no alarm and, and no reason for him to um, to hurry off, as was the case where he had been chased out of the cities before. Um, usually he left um, in such a time. But now it says in chapter 18, he still remained a, uh, a good while or for many days. So apparently he felt safe enough to stay uh, a little while. And then it says uh, he he took off. And so let's get into the the questions now. When Paul departed, who accompanied him and where did they go? Okay, so the, the text says he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And who was with him? Aquila and Priscilla. And where did he go? We just, we said it. It's right there up on the screen too. They sailed for Syria. Okay, and why did Paul have his hair cut off at Sincrea? Well, the text simply said he had taken a vow. Um, so Antioch in Syria is going to be his destination. Remember, this uh, Antioch of Syria is going to be the um, the, the the main Gentile church center, uh, the Christian church where uh, Paul had started and ended his, his first missionary journey. 
and he is going to sail to um, this place to where he is going to end his second missionary journey and start his third uh, journey as well. Um, it says that he he came to Ephesus. Okay. Now, Sincrea was a seaport uh, of Corinth, about 10 miles southeast of Corinth, as we'll put up on the map here in a little while. Um, now, it's interesting to notice that Priscilla is is mentioned first um, in the, the couple's names. It, it's shown that she has taken a prominent part in this company. Um, now, apparently there had been a church uh, planted in Sincrea, probably during the time that Paul was in Corinth. Um, we don't know why Paul took a vow to uh, and that he why he shaved his head uh, in Sincrea, uh, what kind of vow it was or any such thing. We know that Paul was a Jew and he was still very sensitive to the traditions that the Jews held um, from time to time, um, including observances of some sort of ceremonial thing uh, in some cases. Um, and in any of these cases, he refused to impose these kind of things on the Gentiles uh, who were not bound by uh, any such rituals or, or anything. But Paul, apparently, as, as a Jew, still felt very kindly towards uh, these Jewish customs of which he, he kept in some part um, during his life. But we don't know why or what the, the circumstances of, of why he shaved his head. Um, and to, to make any mention of any reason is just speculation and uh, without any kind of scriptural uh, backing at all. Okay, so they came to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was was due east of, of Sincrea. It was across the Aegean Sea. Um, it could have been in two or three days if the, the conditions on the Aegean Sea were favorable for Paul. Uh, he could have reached it there in just a few days. Now, e Ephesus is an important center in Asia. It was the capital of the province of Asia. And it's mentioned in the book of Revelation, in the, in the letters of Ephesus. It was a, a large city and, which was situated on the western shore of Asia Minor. So who did Paul leave uh, in Ephesus? Verse 19 says, he left them there. Now, it was Priscilla and Aquila who were with him. And in verse 19, it just says they, he left them there. But where did Paul go when he got there? As he normally does, um, he entered into the synagogue. They, uh, the Luke often talks about Paul entering into the synagogue, which was what he did when he entered into a city. And this was for the purpose uh, to reason with the Jews, it says in verse 19. And this is a, a term that Luke uses a lot. He entered into the synagogue um, with the attempt to reason um, with the Jews. And what he was doing uh, is using the Old Testament scriptures to teach them about Christ and about the fulfillment of his coming, his, his death, burial, and his resurrection, and the fact that he is Lord. Um, and, uh, and this is what Paul did often whenever he reasoned um, uh, in the synagogue. Okay. And so the text says, when they asked him to stay longer, a longer time with them, he did not consent. Uh, why was that? What was the reason he gave that he could not stay? He was determined to keep the feast in Jerusalem. Um, 
So, so you know, it, it's kind of interesting to me because normally when he enters into the synagogue, he has a falling out with the Jews and they kind of put him out of the synagogue or force him out. And this time they actually ask him to stay longer, uh, but it's Paul who can't um, for his own reasons because he has to keep the feast uh, in Jerusalem. Um, and so he, he has to sail to Jerusalem uh, and, and he was not able to stay longer in Ephesus. But he does promise them, and as he does keep his promise, um, he says, I will return again to you, God willing. And this, this term, God willing, was a term often used by Christians in the first century. Um, and he did uh, end up returning to, to Ephesus. But he could not stay at that time um, because he had to, he had to leave. Uh, now, this is found in Acts chapter 19. Uh, of which we will talk about, and Lord willing, next time uh, in the next lesson. Where did Paul land, and what did he do when he landed? And this is in verse 22. When he landed in Caesarea, and he greeted the church, okay? Um, Caesarea from Ephesus uh, would have taken about a month to sail. It took about seven weeks. Uh, if we look at chapters 20 and 21, it was about a seven week voyage, uh, depending on the, the conditions. But it, at least a month to get from uh, Ephesus to Caesarea, so quite a long journey. And whenever he landed at Caesarea, which was on the, the, uh, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, it was on the western border of the land of Canaan or, or Palestine, and it was the Roman capital of Judea. Okay, so uh, there was going to be a lot of ship travel back and forth between Ephesus and Caesarea, no doubt. Um, he, he caught one of the the, the sailing vessels that uh, was going that way. Um, it says that in, this, in the scriptures, when he had gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And this is, uh, this is a funny way of saying it because um, when, he went, when it says he went down or gone up uh, to greet the church, and then he went down to, to Antioch. Um, he's talking about ele elevation. He went down. Uh, he had gone up and greeted the church because Jerusalem was a higher elevation. And as you traveled north in the land of Palestine, uh, it, the elevation decreased. And that's why it says that uh, he went down to Antioch. Um, just kind of the opposite uh, way of, of saying it. So really he went south. To greet the brethren and then he went north back to Antioch okay um, so he after he landed in Caesarea he promptly uh, went um, to to Jerusalem and greeted the church there okay uh, this was also um, this highlights the fact that Jerusalem is still a very important Part, and it's still considered the, the center of the Christian faith, the, the mother church, if you will, as some commentators that call it. This is going to be where the apostles were um, at the time. And so when it says he went and greeted the church, he probably met with the apostles and the elders uh, in Jerusalem with the congregation as well um, as he had done um, before. So when he came up uh, at when he went down to the church of Antioch, that is whenever he went back north to, to Antioch of Syria, um, this is the gonna this is gonna be the 
the, the end of his second missionary journey. Um, so this is officially uh, the, the end and the beginning, although it's at the end of chapter 18, um, right around... Um, 22, uh, 22 is where he ends the second journey, and 23 is whenever he's going to start uh, his third missionary journey. Now, if you want to recap the second missionary journey, um, he it occupied about three years. So in these three years, he traveled through um, large portions of Asia Minor, um, including Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. Um, and then he returned back to Antioch um, by going through Ephesus and then to Caesarea, then up to Jerusalem, and then back down to, to Antioch. Uh, remember, during this time, he had been resisted by uh, the Jews in nearly every place except Athens and Ephesus. Uh, and so there were many churches that were established in these three years. It could have been many other uh, churches that were in cities that were close to these main cities while Paul was staying there and as he was um, converting more disciples into Christ and um, so the, the, the spread of Christianity in Asia Minor um, on the account of Paul was, um, was quite numerous and, and great. Okay, so this is the verse 23 is where we officially put as the start of his third missionary journey and this is going to run uh, into the, the next chapter uh, chapters and uh, we're going to end this lesson at the end of chapter uh, 18 but the third missionary journey will be continued in the next lesson or two so we we leave Caesarea and we return to Antioch where he had started and, and began his, uh, started and ended his first missionary journey and now his second missionary journey and after spending some time in Antioch, where did he go next? Verse 23. And he went all over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order. That is in successive order. So as he goes through Galatia and Phrygia, um, he's probably visiting the, the brethren um, there and the, the various congregations. Um, this is probably going to be around A.D. 54 when he begins his third missionary journey uh, is, is a good date to, uh, to put it. Um, now, this is going to be the last time that Paul sees Antioch of Syria. Um, his third missionary journey does not end the same way that the first and second do. Um, And this time, he's not beginning his journey with either Barnabas or Silas uh, to help him. But he does have help um, through this journey. So what did he do in these regions? Now, he strengthened all of the disciples, Okay, as we said before. All right, so... What certain Jew came to Ephesus? And I have it right up there. Apollos. Uh, a certain Jew is, is just a signified, or not a signified, but a, a, I guess a, an important way of expressing that Apollos uh, had a, an important role in this um, ministry of Paul. Uh, he um, it, it said many things about him in his favor. And what things in the scriptures are said about Apollos. And let's read to the end before we um, answer any more questions. It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. 
This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, and when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, so there's some things that uh, I read uh, about Apollos. And what are these things that are uh, explained about him? Uh, he was born in Alexandria, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. What else? He was an eloquent man, which means he was a, an educated man. Uh, so going with that, he was mighty in the scriptures. This would have been the Old Testament scriptures as we wouldn't have had um, um, the New Testament formed yet. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. And he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. And what else? One last thing. He only knew the baptism of of John. Okay, there's several things in there that I want to go over, but first, um, he was born in Alexandria. So right off the bat, Alexandria was the probably the educational capital of the world. You, have you heard of the great uh, library of Alexandria that has since been lost? Um, but it was the greatest uh, library ever formed. Now, Alexandria was named for Alexander the Great, who, who formed the city. Uh, many Jews came to Alexandria because, um, in the first place, uh, they, uh, they were encouraged to come there. In the second place, at another time, they were sent there uh, in, in, the hunt, in, the, in the tens of thousands uh, as slaves. Uh, but there were a lot of Jews there. And it was during this time in Alexandria, before Christ, in the two to three hundred years before Christ uh, or so, um, that the Septuagint was formed. The Septuagint is the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. This would have been the, the, the same Old Testament that Jesus uh, was quoting from in his ministry as we have in the New Testament. Um, so it the Septuagint, uh, it literally means 70 um, uh, because of the 70 or 72 uh, scholars that, that were responsible for translating the, the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek. Greek had become the, the centralized language and that was the idea of Alexander to, to spread the Greek language, the Greek culture and ideas and medicine and all of this to the known, uh, his known conquered world at the time. And Greek is still the predominant um, culture and language at the time of Paul. So the, the fact is, Apollos is, is born in Alexandria and he is a Jew, okay? And so um, there were many Jews in Alexandria and Apollos was born, born a a, a Jew, and he was raised in Alexandria with obviously with a lot of uh, education, and he he studied the Old Testament, and he knew the scriptures, he he knew about the prophecies, and apparently he was uh, taught from either uh, John the Baptist or some of his disciples, because he. W spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, that is, the prophecies about Jesus and his coming, but he only knew the baptism of John. So uh, at this point, he was lacking. Maybe he didn't know that Christ had already died and, and, and raised and was seated at God's right hand, and, and maybe he didn't know uh, about uh, Pentecost and, and what had happened there in Jerusalem. Again, he was in uh, Egypt, um, so so he was lacking in some of the information, although it wasn't really his his fault. And so 
when Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollo speak, and I'm sure that was something to behold, um, what did they do? They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And again, it's interesting to note that in the scriptures, the, the order of Aquila and Priscilla is again with uh, Aquila first in reference to the fact that they taught Apollos. And so uh, Aquila being the, the man um, took the lead in teaching the scriptures to, to Apollos. Um, and I believe that's um, why this is ordered the way it is. And they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This, this expression, they took him aside, um, it is more than just taking him out of the room and then just giving him a quick, quick bit of information about where he was lacking. They, they taught him. They sat down with him probably in their home and they took him aside and spent time with him to teach him the way of God more accurately. And being, and this speaks to the, uh, the qualities of Apollos also, that he was um, humble enough in, in, his, um, in, in his state to, um, to sit and learn. Um, now these would have been, uh, Aquila and Priscilla would have been taught by Paul. And so they would have had a lot of um, very useful information to teach. Uh, Apollos. Now, he he knew the baptism of John. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance, um, as we're going to talk about here in chapter 19. Um, and I believe that he, if he didn't, if he only knew the baptism of John, he hadn't been baptized in the name of the Lord. And so I imagine that was part of this instruction that they had uh, given him as well. Um, he, did, he knew and preached the coming of the Messiah and, and probably held the testimony of that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, and so, so he began to speak boldly in, a, in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Okay, so now he's fully caught up and um, Okay. And then when Apollos desire, desired to cross into Achaia, what did the brethren do? And they wrote a letter um, exhorting the disciples in Achaia to receive him. This was a letter of commendation. Um, these letters Paul refers to in his second um, epistle to the, uh, the Corinthians in chapter 3 uh, and in verse 1. Um, having written letters of accommodation and received letters of accommodation, Paul said that he didn't need any such, uh, any, any such thing himself. Um, but a Priscilla and Aquila would have been well known in Corinth, and so their letter of commendation would have, would have carried a lot of uh, influence uh, as they had um, given this letter to, and sent it with, with Apollos and sent him on his way. And whenever he arrived in Achaia with this recommendation, you know, what, what did Apollos achieve there? Well, he greatly helped those who had believed. Um, now, by the grace of God, they had learned of Jesus Christ and had become uh, Christians. And um, these people were greatly helped by Apollos who came over. And so it shows that he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so uh, maybe at that time before Apollos came that Achaia was having a problem with the Jews in the region coming and trying to overpower them um, as far as their teaching, and the Achaeans did not know what to say or how to say it. 
Uh, they weren't learned enough in order to refute the Jews themselves. Um, and so they required somebody like Apollos to come over um, who had uh, much more knowledge and much more ability in preaching. Uh, again, he was, he was eloquent, but he was mighty in the scriptures. He was fervent in spirit. And so his, uh, his personality is exactly what they needed to refute these Jews and he did so publicly, strengthened the disciples that were there in their faith um, by the way that he was able to look through the Bible, or look through the, the Old Testament and, and show that Jesus is the Christ. And this helped them greatly. And this influence uh, was so great that it, it ended up causing a problem in the church uh, of Corinth. And... Uh, there was such a strong connection between him and um, the, the brethren at Corinth that some started um, following him and, and, and forming loyalty to the man instead of, and to the man Apollos instead of to Jesus Christ. And so um, by saying, I am of Apollos, uh, others say it, I am of Paul, uh, I am of Cephas, uh, etc. And so this turned into kind of a branded loyalty, kind of a preacheritis problem um, that Paul had to correct in that church uh, in Corinth. But in any case, Apollos was obviously a mighty Christian and a, a very learned person, and he spent a lot of he spent a considerable amount of time studying the scriptures something that we should emulate. Um, if you want to be able to um, prove from the scriptures the things that you believe, you need to be like Apollos. Um, you need to search through the scriptures and you need to study them and you need to learn the skill of, uh, of being able to answer the questions by knowing where to go in the scriptures to answer them. And that takes time and it takes uh, a lot of reading and study but it's well worth it because of the results. And obviously it, it strengthens your own faith and your own knowledge, but then you're able to, uh, to help many people. Um, as pa Apollos refuted the Jews publicly, um, we still need many Christian men who are able to refute false doctrines um, and error um, with the power that Apollos um, showed as well. So a very good example for, for anybody who is aspiring to be a uh, a preacher of the gospel. Um, you have to learn your trade um, in order to be effective. So let's look at some uh, illustrations now uh, before we we leave this evening. Now this is the uh, the map of um, Sincrea. When he came to Sincrea, uh, he he shaved his head because he had taken a vow, and and so this is where he would have gone. Sincrea was. Um, Easter, east, east of Corinth, and so you have uh, here. He sailed. He from there he sailed for Syria again. Syria is across the Aegean Sea, and uh, uh, and on the the coast of the uh, the Mediterranean. This is probably what the ships looked like that he sailed in. Um, kind of a, a model of a first century Roman merchant ship. Of course, again, there was a lot of trade between, um, and there would have been a lot of trade uh, between Ephesus and uh, Syria, both being capitals of the respected, uh, or Caesarea. Again, here's a mosaic from the second century. It matches right along what we see here, um, which was a model of a first century uh, merchant ship. Not too uh, much unlike the ships that we're used to seeing just from a couple of hundred years ago. And, and so I, I thought these were pretty neat to imagine that this is the kind of vessel that Paul might have traveled on. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is a view of uh, Sincrea uh, in the Gulf there. As you're, this is looking from the west. 
So you can see the landscape here, um, a lot of farmland, and then you have um, on the east and west, you have more of a hilly mountainous region. This is Sincrea and Corinth noted uh, on the map, so it kind of gives you a, an idea of, of how Paul would have traveled to get there. And then from Sincrea, he sailed off. This is the harbor um, near a, a, an ex excavated Byzantine church in Sincrea. Obviously, not much left of it, but um, here is a, another view of the harbor that he would have sailed off from, from in ancient days. And again, the harbor here. Okay, here is the, the route of travel from Sincrea. He goes to Ephesus, and from there, uh, again, he entered the, the synagogue in Ephesus, but he could not stay. Uh, he left Ephesus and told them he'd come back, but from there he sailed off to Caesarea. Um, and then from Caesarea, he, he went up to meet to greet the church, and then he went back down in elevation to, to Antioch. This is in Ephesus, um, as, as we have here, uh, the ruins of the, the great theater and a, an ancient street. And here is a street level view of the, the harbor street. This goes into, uh, that goes to and from this, the, the harbor. And again, the, uh, you can see the bases of a lot of pillars here in Ephesus. It was a, uh, had a lot of idols in Ephesus also. Being the capital of this Asian province, uh, of, of the Roman province, it would have had a lot of the, the Greek gods um, as well, just like in Corinth. And this is going to be the great theater of Ephesus uh, with, uh, you can see in the distance, um, the, the, the sea and the ancient harbor. Ephesus here uh, in the end of the first century and beginning of the second century was um, not a very safe place to be where uh, persecution was, to the, the Christians was, was very severe. And this is the commercial agora in Ephesus. You can see here the ruins. But it, it's neat that, you know, obviously this grove of trees might or might not have been there in the same fashion in ancient days, but the, the view of the mountains certainly would have been the same. This is Caesarea from... Uh, the west, you can see in the in the waters how the, the waters have overtaken a lot of this port um, and now they're submerged, um, submerged because of the rising uh, uh, or the lowering of the the harbor. And here you have kind of a, uh, it just shows you where everything is. Again, everything on the, the ancient um, shores is now underwater. And here's another view. Very interesting to see um, how all of this might have looked. Again, this is another uh, view with some labels. You can see where the temple um, now this is a temple because Caesar worship was common uh, and oftentimes required during these times this is one of the Roman roads again not in very good shape but it's amazing that it still exists and it's a lot of these roads are still used 2,000 years later this is a Roman mile marker. Um, these would have been set up all through um, the land, and these are how they, I mean, just like we have mile markers today, they just use big 
pieces of stone. Um, this is the fourth mile of the road between um, Antipatris and Laud. And here is uh, Jerusalem. When he, remember when he landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, so he would have come to Jerusalem. Um, this is the, the highlighted blue area is going to be the Jerusalem as it existed in the first century. And you can see how Paul would have come up in elevation there. There at the top. This is Antioch. And remember, after he left Jerusalem, he went back down to Antioch, where he began his third missionary journey. And this is a view of from the south. So this would have been what Antioch looked like as he traveled um, to the north. You can see how it goes down in elevation. More sea level. Uh, here's a couple of uh, ancient coins from around this area. Um, a couple of coins of Antioch that would have been circulated. They look, they look pretty similar to our pennies today. But these are bronze. Uh, this is um, the Emic Plain from the Syrian Gates. Just, it's amazing how we can just see, you know, what the landscape would have looked like here. Here's another Roman road. You know, when he went to the re region of Galatia and, and Phrygia, no doubt, he when he landed there, he he would have come through. Uh, Tarsus, um, where he was from, and this is a road north of Tarsus in Cilicia. And we talked about Cilicia in the in our study already. And again, this is the Cilician Gates through the Tarsus Mountains. So this is what the mountains would have looked like in Paul's day, primarily, give or take a few earthquakes. And this is going to be in Alexandria. We talked about Alexandria br briefly, but only as it related to Apollos. But this is what Apollos would have grown up seeing. This ancient Roman theater would have been there. And we have these theaters, um, as you can tell, in a lot of the major cities that we've been talking about. And here is our last map here. As he left Antioch and began his third missionary journey, he went into the, the region of Galatia and Phrygia. As you can see here, uh, traveling these Roman roads, um, he would have gone through Galatia first and then Phrygia, back over to Ephesus where he promised that he would return. Um, this would have been Paul's route. This is going to be modern Turkey. The Ephesus and the, the churches of Asia in the book of Revelation are all found in modern day Turkey. And there's, there's some work currently going on to um, excavate these churches, although it's been very difficult um, for political reasons to, to get in there and do any um, consistent work. But there's current work being done and research being done there uh, around this area. Okay. Uh, another lesson completed. Uh, I hope you appreciated the illustrations. I know I always do. I have so many more of them. I promise I won't show too many of them. Uh, thanks for spending the time with me in this lesson. Um, next time we're going to continue in Paul's third missionary journey. We just began, uh, but that's going to be chapter 19. So I hope you, you get chapters 19 through 21 read. And we will... Um, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of other interesting things and have a lot of other interesting illustrations to look at as well. Uh, but Lord willing, we'll see you again next time. I appreciate it.